Well, I firmly believe that all comminuted intraarticular fractures, the distal radius, demand for satisfactory management some form of external fixation, preferably one that allows correction and maintenance of that correction in three planes. For about 20 years, I used pins and plaster because I was not satisfied with any of the commercially available external fixators that were on the market. Uh, almost immediately upon seeing what had been developed in the wrist jack, I was convinced that here was an external fixator that really indeed provided all of those things that we needed that allowed us to not only correct the fracture, but also maintain that correction and make adjustments in that correction in the outpatient setting. What John Agee has done in his 12 years of development of this wrist jack is to build into it virtually every conceivable adjustment that you, the surgeon, might have to make in correcting the fracture alignment. Now, there's no fracture in which you're going to have to use all of those different adjustments, but all of the adjustments are there if you need one or two or more than that for any given patient. External fixation is a real valuable asset in the proper care of difficult distal radius fractures. Frequently it can be used alone, but also in combination with percutaneous pinning or open reduction and internal fixation to restore the anatomy to the distal radius as well as the joint surface. The technology that Fran King and I have developed in our biomechanics lab offers you the ability to selectively reduce these fractures in each of several planes in space with the principle of ligament ataxis obtained by longitudinal traction being extended to include ligament ataxis achieved by dorsal palmar and radial ulnar translation. We have carefully defined all of the anatomical factors that are relevant to the proper design of the operative procedure as well as its accurate use in your patient. The AG wrist jack is the culmination of over 10 years of study and treatment of distal radius fractures and is the highest quality external fixator available today. Its biomechanical design complements the anatomy of a fracture of the distal radius. The wrist jack's gear mechanisms permit independent adjustment of length, dorsal palmar fragment translation, radial ulnar fragment alignment, rotational alignment at the fracture site, and wrist position in the flexion extension plane. The AG wrist jack is molded of a high performance engineering resin that permits steam sterilization and radiographic translucency. The gear driven adjustments take advantage of the functionally intact soft tissue hinges to achieve ligament ataxis in multiple planes. The first section of this surgeon's tutorial will explain and demonstrate the essential elements of the surgical installation of the AG wrist jack on an acute Colley's fracture. The second section will utilize laboratory cadaver experiments to provide a description of principles appropriate to fine-tuning fracture reduction. Familiarization with these principles will help the surgeon selectively obtain fracture reduction while avoiding hand stiffness, carpal tunnel syndrome, and other hand complications. More detailed comments and descriptions are provided in the color-coded surgeon's manual included with each wrist jack fracture reduction system. When we treat a distal radial fracture with an external skeletal fixator such as the wrist jack, I think it's important to both do an initial manual reduction of the fracture with the surgeon's hands, but then place the patient in finger trap traction during surgery so that the longitudinal traction forces utilize the soft tissue envelope to help mold the fracture back into overall uh, gross alignment and to assure that when you place the skeletal pins proximal and distal to the fracture site they are in the best rotational alignment to optimize the use of the external skeletal fixator. Mm -hmm. 
Distally, we favor uh, placing our skeletal pins into the radial base of the index metacarpal and into the distal shaft of the index metacarpal. The first pin, of course, goes through the stable index and long finger metacarpal bases, whereas the more distal pin goes through just the index metacarpal shaft. It's easy to feel the insertion of the extensor copy radialis longus. And of course, this is the uh, distal shaft of the index metacarpal. And it's important to make an open incision to purposefully identify and avoid the branches of the radial nerve. You can see the hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissues. The extensor carpi radialis longus tendon is inserting right here. And I'll hold it in my forceps. And it's easier to, to see it if we just make a slight incision through the, the overlying uh, soft tissues and expose the tendon of insertion of the radialis longus wrist extensor tendon. I think it's useful uh, for orientation purposes. We'll put a little dot on the point of uh, insertion of the pin. And by palpation, I'll feel the carpal metacarpal joint. And we'll place a, a dot there. So this would be the proximal third of a little finger metacarpal. And we want to in, insert that pin along a line extending from the base of the index metacarpal on its radial side towards the proximal one-third of the little finger metacarpal. We place the drill guide on the insertion of the radialis longus tendon, slip the pin down the tube, and then while aiming across the plane formed by the finger metacarpals, while we're aiming at the base of the little finger metacarpal, we drill the pin through the base of the index metacarpal into the base of the long finger metacarpal. Now distally you can see the crest of the index metacarpal shaft. If we make a small incision there, you can gently peel the synovium. I mean you can, if we make a small incision there, you can gently peel the periosteum and the origin of the first dorsal out of the way of the second uh, pin. The second pin that's placed in the metacarpal shaft should always be a shank down pin. Notice this is a three millimeter pin it's shanked down where it enters the bone to 2.5 millimeters to decrease the risk of causing a fracture of the metacarpal shaft. The metacarpal drill guide is configured to allow proper spacing of the distal pins. You can slip the, uh, the drill guide on the first uh, pin and bring the serrated tip down to the shaft of the index metacarpal. I can use the tip of my finger to reference the tip of the drill guide so that the second pin is inserted into the middle of the shaft of the index metacarpal. This one is typically inserted to the first band on the pin. The pin placement guide is used for the proper placement of the radial shaft pins in the forearm. This is a right wrist, so we configure the device such that both letters R are uh, available for me to read them. And then the pin placement guide is placed on the dorsal side of the wrist, referencing it to the head of the ulna. With the head of the ulna marked, this plate is placed against the subcutaneous border of the ulna with this border of the pin placement guide crossing the head of the ulna. This plate is then slipped down until it's snug against the mid-radial aspect of the forearm and we mark two vertical lines which will be the uh, position of the radial shaft pins. The radial shaft pins are placed in the bare spot of the uh, shaft of the radius that's at and just distal to the pronator teres insertion which comes across at about the angle of my index finger. The bare spot is uh, palmar to the radial wrist extensors and just dorsal to the brachial radialis which is exactly where the superficial branch, the radial nerve, moves from deep to superficial. We favor a longitudinal incision that's a little bit bigger than you think you might need 
The most important thing, of course, is to make an open incision to purposely identify and retract the radial nerve and also to avoid nailing the mobile structures, the radial wrist extensor tendons in particular, to the skeleton. In the depths of this wound, you can typically see the forearm fascia with the uh, hemorrhage around the radial nerve as it escapes from the forearm fascia between the brachioradialis on the palmar side of the wound and the radial wrist extensor tendons, the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis on the dorsal side of the wound. This is a beautiful picture and it's, uh, it's typically where you need to be for proper placement of the proximal pins. The most important structure in this wound, of course, is the radial nerve. If it's damaged during the dissection or in, during the insertion of the pins, you have a major problem with your patient in terms of, terms of pain as well as loss of sensation on the dorsal radial side of the hand. In the proximal extent of, of the wound, you can see the tendon of insertion of the proteinary teres tendon on the radial shaft. So the fixation pin should be placed at and just distal to the tendon of insertion of the pronator teres muscle. The drill guide for the radius, of course, reminds us to aim at the ulna. The big fat tubular feet are situated on the radial shaft to align them uh, so that they pass between uh, each the radial and ulnar cortices of the radial shaft. Making sure that each of these feet is snugly uh, holding on to the radius. I'm using the fingers of my left hand to palpate the subcutaneous border of the ulna shaft. We'll take a second large pin, the three millimeter pin, and drill it through both cortices of the radius while taking care to aim at the ulna. We're now going to drill the second pin through both cortices of the radial shaft. Again, being careful not to wrap up the branches of the radial nerve with the pin. Proper pin placement requires insertion of the proximal pins parallel to the distal pins. This is obtained by closed fracture reduction and finger trap traction. The wrist jack comes with an, uh, an extra Allen wrench which is installed on the device so that you'll have an Allen wrench to adjust the device when the patient arrives in your office. The metacarpal bar is removed by loosening this set screw at the proximal end of the metacarpal bar. To facilitate uh, placing the metacarpal bar on the pins, be sure that the uh, set screw is loosened a little bit at the distal end of the device. And then the metacarpal bar is slipped onto the two radial shaft pins and slid down to a point about a centimeter or roughly one finger breadth away from the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb. A single set screw at the distal end is tightened, clamping the device to both of the metacarpal pins. A large pin cutter is then uh, used to cut the pins off flush with the metacarpal bar. The wrist jack is then slipped onto the proximal or radial shaft pins and slipped down to a point that's comfortable to allow you to reinsert this square shaft into that square hole. In order to uh, mount the hand with the metacarpal bar onto the wrist jack, we have to adjust the length of the device by moving this trolley along the beam. To do that, we insert the Allen screwdriver in the distal end of the device. Again, a single lock screw tightens the metacarpal bar onto the wrist jack. With the initial installation of the wrist jack now complete, the following section will review the principles of adjustment as they apply to the proper treatment of the patient. When we're faced with a difficult distal radius fracture, I think it's critical that we study not only the fracture anatomy, that is the extension of the fracture lines into the joints that dictate the proper Malone or Frickman classification, but as importantly, the soft tissues that are intact that dictate the ways in which externally applied loads can be used to affect fracture reduction. So it's these important intact soft tissue hinges such as the dorsal hinge that we use in the concept of multiplanar ligament ataxis
to not only restore length to the radius, but also to tilt the distal radius back towards normal with dorsal palmar and radial ulnar translation. Of all of the issues involved with using external fixation for these difficult distal radius fractures, none are more important than the scrupulous avoidance of the maintenance of excessive traction during fracture healing. For instance, in this patient, treated weeks before this x-ray with external fixation combined with pin fixation of the distal fragments, note that the excessive traction uh, loads are maintained as evidenced by distraction of the radiocarpal joint. This is contrasted with another patient with an external fixator in which excessive loads were used initially to disimpact the fracture and reduce the fracture but then those excessive loads were reduced to a normal radiocarpal joint space. This patient can be expected to maintain wrist motion and avoid hand stiffness in addition to having a significantly decreased incidence of delay and non-union of the fracture. In order to demonstrate the principles of ligament ataxis in several planes, in the laboratory, we have created a Collies type fracture in this cadaver specimen, attached our external fixation uh, system to the specimen, and we have this C-arm fluoroscope unit that will allow us to view the fracture site while the device manipulates the hand and therefore the fracture site in multiple planes in space. As we have discussed, one of the problems in treating distal radius fractures with external fixators is that overpull of the fracture site results in clawing of the fingers and therefore some tendency to permanent stiffness in the hand, particularly at MP and interphalangeal joint level. In this fresh cadaver specimen, we've created a Collies type fracture. And on fluoroscopy, you can see that uh, there is no excessive traction. The fracture site remains reduced and the intercarpal joints here and the radiocarpal joint are not distracted. This specimen, just like your patient with a properly adjusted external fixator, has no evidence of excessive extrinsic finger tightness. The fingers can be passively flexed into the specimen's palm. We are now going to pull the wrist joint apart with excessive traction forces using the gear mechanisms of this fixator. Notice how the traction results in a progressive increase in gap at the radiocarpal as well as the mid-carpal joint of this cadaver specimen. Progressive distraction results in progressive extension of the fingers at MP and interphalangeal joint level. Examination of the patient this time demonstrates classic extrinsic tightness of the fingers with inability to simultaneously flex the MP and PIP joints of the fingers. You can flex the interphalangeal joints only when the MP joint is extended and vice versa but you cannot simultaneously flex both of those joints and therefore the patient with this exam could not actively flex their fingers while their fracture healed. In your patient with this clinical problem, the best thing to do is to reduce the excessive distraction that can lead to delayed or non-union of the fracture site as well as stiffness in the wrist and hand. Note that if we position the wrist in extension, we will accomplish a similar task as far as the fingers are concerned. With the wrist lock unlocked, we can extend the patient's wrist, relaxing the finger extensor tendons where they pass over the dorsal side of the wrist. This wrist motion with the patient in a fixator is not accompanied by any evidence of compromise of the reduction at the fracture site. Wrist extension is accompanied by a diminution in the extrinsic tightness of the fingers with the, an ease of flexing the fingers passively in this position as opposed to a recurrence of extrinsic tightness when the wrist is in neutral or flexion. Let's now lock the wrist in slide extension and we'll remove the residual extrinsic tightness by the preferred method which is to reduce the distraction on the specimen, reducing the distraction of the mid-carpal and radiocarpal joints
as we simultaneously reduce the extrinsic tightness of the fingers from this to where the patient can make a full fist and actively move their fingers during fracture healing. Let's take a minute and look at the principles of the closed treatment of these distal radius fractures and see how those principles can be modified for external skeletal fixation. In this artist's depiction of a typical Collie's type fracture, notice that we have dorsal displacement of the distal radial fragment about an intact soft tissue hinge. If we use longitudinal traction, such as by finger traps, there's an immediate improvement in the overall appositional alignment, but the distal fragment remains tilted dorsally. The problem is, is that if you pull harder, things don't get any better. Notice that additional traction causes the distal fragment to spin around the dorsal soft tissue hinge, which tethers the distal fragment. The clinical problem we face is one in which longitudinal traction, even in excess, is incapable of tilting the distal radial fragment back in the palmar direction. Therefore, clinically, we combine digital pressure with flexion of the patient's wrist while maintaining some traction to restore palmar tilt. What happens mechanically is that the dorsal soft tissue hinge and dorsal capsule of the wrist are tightened by advanced degrees of wrist flexion such that in figure D, each increment of advanced flexion allows the hand to act as a lever to tilt the wrist and distal radial fragments back towards normal. The problem is, is that the maintenance of advanced degrees of flexion is necessary to assure the maintenance of palmar tilt. And this position of the flex wrist causes carpal tunnel syndrome, clawing of the fingers, and stiffness of the hand. In our studies, we have learned to avoid a wrist flex position, which tends to wreck hand function, as we have discovered that palmar translation of the hand can restore palmar tilt. In the top diagram, longitudinal traction is incapable of tilting the distal fragment palmarwardly. Notice that palmar translation, or a palmar shift of the hand on the forearm, restores palmar tilt. It does that initially by subluxing the midcarpal joint with the head of the capitate walking out the palm side of the lunate as the strong palmar ligaments become tight. Further palmar translation of the hand then rotates the entire distal radial fragment or fragments palmarwardly to restore palmar tilt. It's the maintenance of this palmar shift or translation of the hand on the forearm irrespective of wrist position in the flexion extension plane that allows us to not only obtain but maintain palmar tilt during fracture healing. These same principles apply in a less dramatic way to radial ulnar shifts of the hand on the forearm for radial ulnar appositional alignment and restoration of ulnar inclination as appreciated on the AP x-ray. Let's first take a look at the effect of dorsal palmar translation of the hand in tilting the distal radial fragment uh, toward normal. As you can see in this specimen, the fracture is reduced. If we run the gear mechanisms, it will translate the hand dorsally. Notice that you have the Collie's type fracture where the distal fragment of the radius is displaced dorsally at the fracture site we've created at the metaphyseal flare. We'll now translate the hand palmar wordly and reduce the fracture. Palmar translation tightens the soft tissue hinge on the dorsal side of the fracture site and restores palmar tilt to the distal radial articular surface. Dorsal displacement, recurrent deformity. Palmar translation incrementally tightens the dorsal soft tissue hinge to restore the palmar tilt towards normal. The blue gear adjustment on the trolley can be used to displace the hand and therefore the distal fragment in an ulnar direction with respect to the proximal fragment. This ulnar radial gear adjustment is used for both appositional alignment at the fracture site as well as tilting of the distal fragment in ulnar and radial directions.
under fluoroscopy, we will rotate the gear mechanism to displace the hand and therefore the carpus in an ulnar direction. Notice that the scaphoid begins to migrate away from the radial styloid, resulting in an increased gap between the styloid and the scaphoid. Progressive ulnar translation of the hand and carpus results in a progressive ulnar inclination of the distal radial articular surface. Full ulnar travel is accompanied by a marked gap between the scaphoid and the radial styloid. In reversing that travel, you can see how radial translation of the hand and the carpus restores the inclination of the distal radial articular surface back towards normal as the scaphoid bumps against the radial styloid. This adjustment is particularly useful clinically in aligning a step off of a fracture that extends into the distal radio ulnar joint. Another feature of the design of this technology allows for the wrist to be adjusted in the flexion extension plane to help avoid clawing of the fingers and hand stiffness. In this cadaver specimen, if we unlock the wrist adjustment, the specimen can be moved at the wrist in the flexion extension plane. We'll turn on the C-arm fluoroscope while we move the wrist. And notice that the wrist joint can move in the flexion extension plane without any substantial loss of reduction at the fracture site. In this palm review of a model of a Collie's type fracture, note that the distal fragment is displaced dorsally with respect to the shaft of the radius. Note also that the distal fragment is pivoting around the distal end of the ulna on the ligaments between these two bones that are not shown in the model. By rotating a single worm gear adjustment, we can simultaneously improve both at positional alignment as well as rotational alignment at the fracture site. Notice that the hand and distal fragment are carried through an arc in space that now has reduced the fracture site both in terms of apposition as well as rotation. Let's look at it again. Recurrent deformity, the hand and distal fragment are carried dorsally and through an arc in space in which the distal fragment pivots around the distal end of the ulna. We reverse the deformity with a single worm gear adjustment, simultaneously improving both appositional as well as rotational alignment at the fracture site. There are other factors that result in a tendency for clawing of the fingers beyond just over distraction of the wrist and or wrist flexion. One of those factors is the manner in which fracture hematoma is accompanied by hand swelling, particularly on the dorsal side of the hand. If we zoom in, you can see that in the normal hand, as in this cadaver hand, Mother Nature has an abundance of skin on the dorsal side of the fingers all the way back to the wrist. In a fat swollen hand following a fracture, such as in this surgeon's glove filled with water, the skin is floated off the dorsal side of the skeleton. On the dorsal side of the hand, the progressive accumulation of edema fluid and hematoma lifts the skin off the skeleton to extend the fingers at MP joint level. Now in this cadaver, we can simulate that by, in, by injecting saline underneath the dorsal skin. Now if we're very careful and not move the specimen as we inject the saline, we should be able to see some extension of the fingers at MP joint and interphalangeal joint level. This, of course, is the classic problem with a fat swollen hand, whether it's from a crush injury or a fracture in the hand or a fracture in the wrist or distal radius. All of these injuries are, are accompanied by a tendency of edema fluid to accumulate not only subcutaneously but also in the dorsal subaponeurotic space deep to the finger extensor tendons. Notice that the skin has been lifted off the skeleton, and now this skin, one centimeter away from the skeleton, has its own uh, 
elastic stretch eaten up, if you will, or absorbed by the distension necessary to accommodate for the saline injection. The tension force of this skin, together with its new height above the skeleton, extends the fingers, particularly at MP joint level, resulting in this intrinsic minus position of the hand. Therefore, there are at least three factors which are easily identified when treating Collie's type fractures that lead to hand stiffness. We have demonstrated how injection of edema fluid into the dorsal side of the hand results in progressive MP joint extension as the skin floats up off the skeleton and produces its own extension moment at MP joint level. That in combination with distraction of the skeleton that is not reduced during fracture healing helps assure a claw or intrinsic minus position of the hand. Notice the distraction extending the fingers at MP joint level. From this position, with your patient in the operating room, use first the least distraction necessary to maintain skeletal length. In synergy with a wrist extended position, achieved by unlocking the wrist lock and placing the patient's wrist in extension to create a functional position of the hand for active range of motion exercises to milk that dorsal edema out of the hand during uh, the acute phase and subacute phase of your patient's recovery. With the review of basic principles now complete, the following section will demonstrate their application on the patient in the operating room. Now we're set to adjust the wrist jack and reduce the fracture. We'll remove our traction distally. In general, we initiate traction to restore length to the skeleton with the wrist in a neutral position. Note that due to the angle we inserted our pins, the patient's wrist is distracted in some, some degree of ulnar deviation. And by rotating it counterclockwise, we can use the principle of ligament ataxis to pull the fracture fragments back to length. You should be able to notice that the fingers begin to extend when we begin to distract and then over distract the fracture site. Notice that the patient now has some element of extrinsic tightness because they cannot easily flex the fingers down to the palm of the hand. I can flex the MP joint or the PIP joint, but I can't easily flex both together. And this is an indicator of extrinsic tightness of the fingers, which if we overdo it, will pull the hand into a claw position. That's excessive. We'll back off a little bit. And now I can passively flex the fingers down pretty good. And then we'll gently slide the wrist jack in and out of the proximal pins and lock the wrist jack to the proximal pins. Now most of these fractures require combinations of longitudinal traction and palmar translation of the hand, the wrist, and the distal fragment on the forearm to reduce the fracture. The proximal adjustment screw marked in green is then rotated in a palmar direction. And notice that this gear displaces the hand palmarwardly, thereby translating the uh, carpus and restoring palmar tilt to the distal radius. Those two adjustments are usually adequate to reduce the fracture. Let's take a look at the fracture alignment on the C-arm fluoroscope. That fracture is a little bit over distracted and we should know that clinically because of the slight extrinsic tightness in the fingers. We're going to uh, rotate the screwdriver through the red adjustment, moving the trolley back proximally to decrease the amount of distraction on this wrist. In general, you can see that the gap between the die punch area and the lunate is gone but there's a persistent gap between the styloid and the scaphoid that needs to be followed and perhaps adjusted further in the clinic. We're going to move the hand dorsally with the wrist jack's gear mechanism. As you can see the recurrence of the dorsal tilt. We'll drive the gear the other direction, moving the hand palmarwardly, and notice how we've restored the palmar tilt. It's an absolute uh, biomechanical fact that you can use translation forces to restore palmar tilt in difficult fractures of the distal radius. What I'd rather do is to unlock that lock and we're going to move the wrist in the flexion extension plane while we look at the C-arm fluoroscope. 
And notice that we can move the wrist in the flexion extension plane without affecting fracture reduction. So a, a central design feature of this device is that the axle for flexion extension adjustment projects to the center of the wrist joint. That allows the surgeon to adjust the wrist position in the flexion extension plane without embarrassing fracture reduction. We prefer, of course, to therefore lock the wrist in a slightly extended position to help uh, maximize the patient's ability to move the, f the fingers during fracture healing. We'll just go over the device quickly to make sure everything's tight. We'll again tighten the uh, device on the radial shaft pins, on the metacarpal pins, tighten the metacarpal bar to the wrist jack, and also make sure that the wrist lock is locked. We'll cut the extra length of the radial shaft pins off just so the patient won't uh, get caught as easily in a garment. Let's have the caps for the pins, please. In general, we prefer to uh, use fairly loose sutures. I think if you close these wounds tightly, you're liable to have problems from a number of standpoints, including excess pressure on the, uh, on the pin tracks. We've now got uh, this young woman's wounds uh, closed, and we want to remember to assess the rotational line with the fracture site. Remember, of course, that it's very difficult if my fingers are the fracture side, if you have a rotational malalignment at the fracture, it's very difficult to gauge that uh, by x-rays. So your best friend there, if your overall x-rays look pretty good, is appreciate where the patient's humerus is, and then supinate and pronate the forearm, and see if that's roughly what you expect. If the patient has some anomalies in that area, be sure to compare forearm rotation on the injured to the normal side. In assessing stability of the distal radial ulnar joint, the, uh, the principle to appreciate is that if this joint is unstable, when the patient goes into pronation, the distal ulna will sublux dorsally on the shaft of the radius at the level of the, of the wrist. Or said differently, the distal ulna will sublux dorsally on the distal radius. In those patients with an unstable distal radial ulnar joint or in someone that you suspect may have an unstable joint, it's best to immobilize them for at least four weeks with the forearm in mid-rotation or slight supination. This position of slight supination from neutral tends to reduce the uh, subluxation of the distal radial ulnar joint and will uh, typically lead to less problems with instability of the distal radial ulnar joint in the post collies fracture patient. And just make sure that there's plenty of room here. In a much more difficult fracture, you'll find a lot of swelling in this area, and you've got to avoid a situation in which the swelling in the wrist puts pressure on the skin at the base of the thumb. Remember before you finish your dressing to take the Allen wrench and install it on the device. You can wrap it inside your dressing. So this wrench is available for your use in the clinic follow-up for adjustment of the wrist jack and ultimately for its removal in a couple of months. A final checklist for proper use of the AG wrist jack should include x-rays of the fracture to confirm satisfactory reduction as well as the avoidance of excessive distraction of the wrist joint. In addition, avoid excessive palmar translation as it can aggravate subluxation of the distal radial ulnar joint and can overreduce the fracture. This type of overreduction can cause a palmar tilting of the distal radial fragment, creating a Smith's deformity or a Smith's type malunion. And finally, Confirm that the patient will be able to actively exercise his fingers post-operatively, as evidenced by the surgeon's ability to passively flex the tips of the fingers into the palm at the time of surgery. This concludes our tutorial on the principles of treating these difficult distal radius fractures. Remember, it's the principles that count, not the technical details.
At the Hand Biomechanics Lab, we're committed to improving the quality of patient care through the development of new technology. We wish to hear from you if there's anything you can offer us to help us improve the quality of our technology or its application to your patient. Thank you.